Oh, it's so much better than a full of undergraduates at the party. Uh, for those of you who don't already know me, my name is Katie Culver. I'm the director of the Center for Journalism and Ethics and the James E. Burgess Chair in Ethics. Here is School of Journalism and Mass Communication at UW Madison, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our 2019 conference. This is the 11th time we have done this and the biggest crowd that we've ever done this with. So I am really very happy to welcome all of you. I do have a few rounds of thanks to give before we dive into uh, our keynote with Kara Swisher. And so first of all, let me thank all of you for joining us. This is going to be a day of really important and often challenging conversations. And I appreciate the time uh, that you are dedicating to this very, very important set of issues. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, the Evie Foundation, which is the charitable arm of the Capital Times and has long supported the work of the Center for Journalism Ethics. Uh, the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, which has been a terrific partner, a great, uh, a great set of um, ears that we can go to when we want to bounce ideas. Uh, the Wisconsin State Journal, also a, a longtime supporter of the work that we do here. Uh, the Wisconsin Newspaper Association and the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association joined together this year in a new effort to help us bring in um, some journalism students from across the state so that they could also um, uh, participate with us here today. Uh, that partnership is the kind of thing that is really, really important to the Center for Journalism Ethics. We like to think of ourselves as a bridge, a bridge between journalism and the public that it's supposed to serve, between academic research and professional practice. Um, that bridging function um, is, the, is the way we visualize the important uh, things that we do here. I'd also love it if the board members um, from the Center Current and Past uh, who are here today could um, stand, please, and I'd like to give them a round of applause. have had a lot of opportunities to work with great people, um, but they are just such a pleasure. The ideas that come into the center and the amount of time and effort they put into supporting us is, is really wonderful. Uh, we also receive a, a great deal of support from our colleagues in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Uh, my colleague, Lindsay Palmer, who is affiliated with the center, is there in the back, and I think she would uh, she would also share uh, the thanks that we give to all of them for, uh, for what they do to support us. You'll see a number of of young faces in the room, which is great. One of the missions of the center is to support uh, student understanding of ethics. And there are a lot of students coming and going throughout the day. Uh, but the really wonderful set is our student fellows. Uh, the fellows uh, the program was established four years ago in the center, and we're now up to five um, student fellows who join us uh, weekly and write for our um, website and contribute to social media and make this con help make this conference uh, what it is. I'd also like to thank the she may be hiding. Oh no, there she is. Krista Eastman uh, in the back there, who is not happy that I'm doing this. Krista joined uh, the center in June as our uh, brand new administrator and has blown the doors off of the place. She has been um, absolutely central to a number of new initiatives and to things like growing uh, this conference attendance as much as we have this year. So it's been wonderful. So one round of applause to all of those people. Further ado, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker up to the stage. So, Kara, do you want to come sit? So, Kara Swisher, who uh, drew many of you here today, I know you're not here for me. Uh, Kara um, is the editor at large at Recode and host of the Recode Decode podcast, which is uh, on my must listen uh, weekly um, set of podcasts. I absolutely um, benefit from every single minute when I listen to that podcast. Uh, she's also co-executive producer of the Code Conference, has a special series on MSNBC called Revolution, and also writes for the New York Times. We're going to reference the story in just a bit that ran this morning um, that, that uh, Kara has written. I first encountered uh, Kara's work um, through the Wall Street Journal's uh, big conference, D, All Things Digital. Uh, we had this constant connection. Um, that's how I learned about D, was through Pete Kafka. Um, and that work with Walt Mossberg in that conference was absolutely groundbreaking. It was the kind of high-tech conversation that made a person like me seem like she knew things at cocktail parties. <laughs> it was kind of really good social capital for someone who was trying to watch digital disrupt disruption before that was a um, 
journals eventually done to death, I think. Um, I also recall Kara, um, I think it was the only time Steve Jobs and Bill Gates ever had a public conversation together, and Walton, you're interviewed, and I have seen that many, many times of the uh, electricity between those two people who have been so competitive and then found their way back together is absolutely fascinating. Uh, Kara's background also includes time at the Washington Post and the and Washington City Paper. Uh, she's a graduate of Georgetown's Foreign Service School and uh, Columbia University's uh, Master's in Journalism program. Uh, New York Magazine has called Kara Silicon Valley's most feared and well-liked journalist. Today, we are going to dig into how you have managed uh, to flip both sides of that very important journalistic coin. Uh, so we're going to uh, talk about what it means to cover tech, a male-dominated world, in a way um, as sort of fearless and, and rich and informative as Kara has done. So let's have a round of applause and we'll dig into our keynote conversation. I told Kara I'm really intimidated to be interviewing a uh, interviewer, so if she holds the mic, I'm going to hold the mic. Okay, uh, so I want to start out um, earlier in your career. So you decided that you were going to cover tech, this super male-dominated field. Yeah, Why? Know. What led you to that decision, and what are some of the barriers you faced? Well, it was really by happenstance. Um, I, was, I was at the Washington Post. I was at the business section, which at the time was a backwater at the Washington Post, and everywhere, until uh, Barbarians of the Gate kind of broke through business reporting. And I was covering retail, which was fascinating because a lot, you know, what what, what went on there was really was really integral to what was happening in the in the internet too. Um, I was covering the end of big department stores, big local chains that were really hurting the business of newspapers. Uh, and I was blessed working with uh, someone like Don Graham, one of the owner, owners of the Washington Post, who let me do really tough reporting on local retail. I didn't, I never heard of all the complaints he got about me. Later, he told me years later, um, and protected me from that. And so I was writing about it quite a bit, and I was sort of starting to pay attention to some digital things. I, I was very interested in really early very early ways to communicate digitally. Um, I had been dating someone who lived in Russia and was communicating over these very complex computer networks. Um, and, and just got a, a sort of a little bit of a taste of that and thought, this is super interesting. Um, I had spent a year, uh, I mean, a semester at the University of, um, uh, in South Carolina, University of uh, North Carolina, UNC. Um, they had a teaching thing that Washington Post reporters cycled through. Um, and I had a semester there at one of their schools, and I had um, I started to use different internet things that were very early. And I I've told the story a number of times. I downloaded a Calvin and Hobbes book um, on a server, and I, the the geek guy who was running it was furious at me because it took up time and it blocked things. And I kept saying to him. And he's like, you messed up the system. And I said, I downloaded a book. And he goes, you messed up the system. I go, I downloaded a book. And then he goes, I, he messed up this. It was ridiculous. I said, do you understand what I just did? I just digitized something that had been analog. And so I, got, I was very early to the concept of what it meant and what portability, mobility meant, um, and, and became further entranced by it and started covering AOL, um, the company that is no longer, uh, essentially. Um, but I wrote, ended up writing a book about it. I was very interested in what they were doing, commercializing it. I, I covered Al Gore because he had done the legislation to make the internet commercial. So I started covering it. Yeah, he did. Yes, he did. No, that is unfair. He was integral to it. He was in the government invented the internet um, as, a, as a way to protect us in times of uh, nuclear war. But, um, but he did. He was critical. He was absolutely critical to inventing the modern internet. I'm looking at commercials, so it's a, he should have said it that way, but he certainly was a key player. Um, and so, it's not the first time politicians say stupid things. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry what she went through. I was like, you put her through it. Okay, I would just like to say sorry. Please, Uncle Joe. Um, so, um, so that I just sort of want to sit underneath them and go, um, so, uh, so anyway, so I, I did that and started covering the internet early. And so I got to meet a lot of the very early internet people. I wasn't covering 
technology was covering the internet, which I thought was different because I understood it to be, uh, you know, just just the way the printing press. I, I saw it as that. I saw. I, I studied propaganda. I studied all kinds of things in, in Columbia and. I really did see it being like the printing press or television or radio, and I, under, I think I understood very early what it meant uh, for journalism, for everything. And so I went to the Wall Street Journal to cover it because I felt like the Post was vulnerable to classified problems with classifieds, with display advertising, with subscriptions, and I and I it was a good platform to write from because the Post at the time wasn't as national as it is today. Uh, under Bezos' ownership. And so I just started writing about it, and nobody covered them. I wrote a book about it, and nobody covered them for a long time. Um, this was the early 90s. And then I, I met them all when they weren't billionaires, which is a good place to start with these people, I think. Um, and so I understood their psyches and spent a lot of time with them, Bezos and uh, Jerry Yang and uh, Mark Andreessen and everything else. So I saw them at the dawn of their Fantasticness, I guess, in my opinion, but um, but early on, and so I was able to cover them and understand them. And then as more in, things piled up, the Google guys, things like that, I met them early, and I met the Airbnb people early, and the Uber people early, and stuff like that. So I just I just was fascinated by the societal changes. Did gender matter? Did it matter in your well, reporting, or were you just a really solid beat reporter on the internet? And I, think, I think beat reporting goes a long way. I'm a really good beat reporter, um, and I think I'm better than most people. I, I'm very persistent. I call everyone. I spend a lot of time texting, talking. You know, I talk to a lot of people. And so I think they're, they're, being a really good beat reporter, I think, is the, is the, has, to be, has to be the foundation for any great reporter. No, you can't just pontificate on stuff. You have to really you know what you're talking about and have some history. Um, so I think I was a really good beat reporter. I was also, I kind of covered it in a, in, a, in a way that wasn't so technical. A lot of, you had two kinds of reporters, ones that were highly technical that, that assumed that regular people wanted to understand the insides of a ship, which they don't, right? Like, do you know how your car works? I don't know, it, it drives you, right? That's the key part of it. And so if you're you know into that, you can write that stuff, you know, if you're, if you're an auto newsletter or whatever. But I was really interested in the, I always used to say, I'm not going to tell you how the watch works, I'm going to tell you the time. And so I thought of it that way, and I thought of it as a narrative, and I, and I wanted to talk about personalities. I think so I covered it from a personality point of view, the people, the impact, and things like that, and, and covered it as a narrative, like this is going to change your world. And I kept saying that to people, this is going to change your world, this is going to change media, this is going to change entertainment, this is going to change everything. And so I think I, I had a sweep of the story more than other people. And then I knew everybody, because it was a small world. Well, it's, it's interesting, the idea this is going to change everything. I'm gonna, I'd like to use that to turn to mm -hmm. um, some of the, the reporting on Me Too. So the, right. the movement overall, but specifically coming at it from, from the journalism perspective, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think were some of the strengths of that reporting, the strengths of choices made in that reporting, and then what are your critiques? Well, you know, this is the problem. This is one of these stories that was hiding in plain sight, right? Like everybody knew, like everybody knew, and everybody understood it or put up with it. And one, one of the things that early on, right before Me Too, we had covered the Ellen Powell trial um, in Silicon Valley. Ellen was a really very good venture capitalist. She was working for Planet Perkins. She, it was, it was a complicated story, as are most human stories. Um, but it was the, the sort of story venture capital firm, and there was allegations of sex, gender bias, and uh, it wasn't sexual harassment in that case, it was, um, it was gender bias, essentially. And that she had been treated badly because she was there with someone, and then there was all kinds of behaviors on the part of some of the partners. And so the lawsuit was great. It was really great insight into how Silicon Valley worked. And so we covered it. Um, you know, I decided since I was running the show, and it's, let me just say to people, women, you should run the show. Like running the show is really good because you can order people around. Um, and I, I really like that method. I like that. <laughs> really like, how come you like get in charge? Like that's how you do it, um, and really get in charge in a way that people can't change what you want to do. So I decided, that, and and with my editors, uh, two male editors actually, to cover it. Um, at, like it was the Super Bowl. Like we're going to put two really good reporters on it, um, and we're going to cover the heck out of it. We're going to really you know, every day. And one one of the reporters was Liz Gaines, who's now working for Google, actually, you know, and then the other one was Nellie Bowles, who's now working for the New York Times, great reporter for the New York Times. And so we put them 
on it like crazy. And Nellie's a great feature writer, she loves features, Liz is an incredible beat reporter, and we covered it like all the time. What was interesting is as we started to cover it, other people started, you know, then the New York Times paid attention, then this paid attention. So it was it was really clear that people had an interest in this. And there was what was fascinating to me through that coverage was that every woman had ten stories like this. And they were on a continuum of, you know, Uncle Creepy, you know, like grabs my shoulders, don't like that so much, don't like the hugs, to statements, kind of icky statements, to the issues around their jobs and whether they could do them. I had had one myself when I was pregnant, when I got back from pregnancy leave. I was literally the top tech reporter at the Wall Street Journal, one of the top editors, not Paul Steiger, but one of, one of them near the top, sat me down when I got back and said, uh, so you'll be needing more time now, you know? And I was like, for what? And he was like, uh, and I was like, what do I need more time for? What, what, what do you mean? What do, is there something changed? And he was like, uh, and I said, it can't be that baby because, you know, that would be wrong for you to say that. <laughs> and, and, and he was, it was fascinating. He, I was like, he had children, his wife, too, you know what I mean? And it was, and he, and he was like, uh, and he did that, uh, thing, like, oh, shit. And, and, he, and he was like, uh, and I said, never talk to a woman like that again. I said, oh, do my job just fine. Thank you. So, Story, and then it went went up to the really bad ones, right? So most people were down in this zone, but they're still bad. It just it just like just it's, I call it a tax. It's a tax on women. It really just is. It's stuff that like it's an extra tax we pay, and and it it, it just like why it like gets in the way. And so and you know someone like me gets it like which I don't, I don't think I welcome any kind of sexual harassment. Would recognize they lose their arms and both legs. But, um, but, they, um, but what's interesting is, it, is that, it, that it, everybody had it. And what was most interesting was all the men, a lot of men, good men, like, by the way, like, uh, there's so many people that really want to change and understand that it's a problem. All what I call the good men um, didn't know about it. Like, it was sort of like a giant amnesia. And, oh, I didn't know it. Whether it was because the women didn't talk about it or they weren't paying attention or they didn't, you know, it was lack of empathy. That was fascinating to me, that, that delta. And so that was how we did it. And I think that's why the Me Too thing was so surprising to people and so shocking. Now, we had some, like, cases, like Harvey Weinstein, like, which is just, he's just a rapist. Like, that's just a rapist. And so, and he got away with it, and everyone knew about it. I knew about it. And, like, I had heard stories about it. And I didn't cover the entertainment industry, but, like, it, it was really interesting is that nobody went after it. And so I think going after it, and it wasn't, it was not heavy lifting reporting to do it, because once it, once the once the gate opened, everyone said, oh, yeah, also me too. Like, I, I understood that. And so I think one of the things was waiting so long, and I kind of, like, what, what exactly took so long? And I have some thoughts on that. I think, you know, uh, all male editorial boards, folk, things like that. Um, and not just that, because it was like Ronan Farrow who, um, you know, did a lot of really great reporting. There were two great reporters at the New York Times um, who, who did a lot of the reporting, and, and Washington Post did some, lots of people, everybody did, Los Angeles Times did, or Jane Mayer did amazing work. Um, but but what to me was really interesting is that a lot of the reporting were, were, were done by people who had been unsafe. You know what I mean? Themselves, even women, grown as gay, like, you know what I mean? It just was fascinating to me to see who had done the reporting. Um, and I thought, I thought it was done really well. I think the problem is it was so shocking, it came out in such, everyone did a maze too, too straight, it exhausted people, just like this Trump stuff, it's exhausting. Like, when you said something like today, it's a coup, a, a, you know, and a normal investigation of a coup, you're just exhausted, it's like just Wednesday. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, it's just Wednesday, you know, it's, it's on someone, someone an awful thing. So I think the exhaustion level of how it's covered, I think people are like, and, the, and the, I think probably by the criticism, the lack of what do we do now? How do we interact in the office? How do we talk? And so I think I get like from a lot of men, like, how do I act now? I'm like, well, just don't grab people's boobs. Let's start there and then move on. Like, let's move on. Like, it's sort of interesting that nobody understands how to behave, although I think everyone really does secretly you know what you're not supposed to do. Um, and so that's, I think, lack of solutions, I think, was probably the name. I mean, otherwise, I think it was great. And 
hopefully it will not have this sort of going back underground kind of thing. I think it will be built totally, but you know, there's so there will be you think long term social change coming out of this because there 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 is the concern that there was some excellent reporting, a yeah. lot of attention, but are we experiencing some kind of flame out that, that we're sort of we're yeah. already getting back into the it's hiding in plain sight. So do you think? Do well, you think I don't know. No, I don't think you can get away quite with Harvey Weinstein. Anymore. I don't think there will be that again. There's going to be there's going to be more surreptitious behavior. It's going to be harder to report on. Um, but I think you know there was just an amazing piece by uh, Taffy. Um, I can't her last name. Rodner. Uh, she's at the New York Times about sterling jewelry, the, the chain, which was just you know it's a long time ago. But what is she wrote? She's a beautiful writer, and so she covered it. The writing really made that piece. But I, I urge you to read it. It was an amazing piece, and at the end, she talks about herself and shame. It was great. It was a really great piece. Um, you know, that was a long time ago, but it still was pertinent. Like I thought it was pertinent, and it talked. It really made you understand why people would want to be part of the figure. So. Anyways. When we first started talking about this discussion, you threw out the title, Me and the Dudes of Silicon Valley, A Tragedy in Three Parts. So I'm curious what the three parts are. Um, well, you know, the first part is, is, is lack of self-awareness. Like, I think the tragedy is that a lot of these people are great people and innovative and interesting and and changing the world. They really are. A lot of these devices and, and technologies are changing. And there's no question. Um, but I think one of the tragedies is this lack of self-awareness on their part. I, I always say that people in, this is a line I use a lot, but people in Silicon Valley, it's a miracle they can look in mirrors because um, they have no self-awareness. You know, they have no idea of the damage they cause. They have no idea of the, the way they set up structures. Um, you know, like we did a piece on uh, the, this guy who was working at Google who had a problem with sexual harassment and he left Google because of the investigation, and it was sort of bygones, like, it was investigated, and it was sort of, you need to leave, and it was all under the, it was sort of like the pedophile priest, not awful like that, but it was that kind of thing. And then he goes over to Uber. He, it was interesting, because I had had lunch with him, he was a very high-ranking executive at Google, and uh, he was saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I have 7,000 people at my display, like bragging as they all want to do. Um, and uh, and then he leaves suddenly a month later, so I text him, I'm like, wow, what happened to the grand plans of running the earth? And, um, oh, I wanted to spend more time with my family, my <laughs> So I was like, hmm, what happened? And I just sort of put it aside, and then he pops up at Uber, a little while, running engineering. And I was like, huh, what happened to his grand plan with his philosophy, you know, his family? What happened to that? And so I said, like, what happened to that? Oh, this was too big enough. Like, okay. You know what I mean? Like, of course, I believe nothing that this person's telling me. And, uh, and then I started poking around and found out that this had happened. And so I wanted to know if, and then the Susan Fowler thing popped up. I, I like squirrel away things a lot of the time. And then the Susan Fowler thing happened, and he was in charge of her department. And it wasn't his fault. He, he was not part of the original awfulness. Of the world. Um, but it was really interesting. And I was like, wow, the guy in charge of running engineering at Uber just got the job that has sexual harassment history. That's awkward. And so I called up Travis Kalanick and I said, did you know that this was a, what are you talking about? And I was like, no, oh, I'm telling you of information you don't have. Like, it was really interesting. And so that's the kind of thing, this lack of, like, that this was a wrong thing to do, to pass along this person without information uh, because of all kinds, they had all kinds of justifications. So lack of self reflection is one of the things that I think is tragic in this group of people. And it's already seen itself not just in Me Too, but in what's happening on our social networks, the behaviors they're having uh, around uh, violating your privacy, the damage that they're doing via their inventions and lack of awareness about it. So it's the same, it's the same thing, like all over the place. So lack of self-awareness. Uh, the second part that I find tragic in these people is that they they equate um, uh, money with um, with social good. You know what I mean? They equate themselves because they're rich that they must be right. Um, and I, I am often saying to people, you know, in Silicon Valley, you're so poor, all you have is money. 
um, because they don't have a bigger sense of everything. So a lack of, of feeling of a larger community around the world when you have this much wealth and, and power to not be able to understand what that means or take responsibility for it. And I try really hard to use like comic book things. Like it's not a comic book quote, but it's from, it's also, it was in Spider-Man where with great uh, power comes great responsibility. They seem to get that. Like, oh, that was inspired. Right, good, let's start from there. Um, so it's actually, it's, it's hard to know where the quote came from. It did not come from Spider-Man. So, um, so anyway, so I, that's my, the lack of, 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 of that was really disturbing to me. Um, and then lastly, um, the, the inability to, 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 the inability to understand and empathize with people that are not with you. You know what I mean? For the, given that they're the most tolerant people on earth, and a lot of them are, like there's a lot of tolerance in these things, the inability to understand what's happening to the rest of the country and how you create this permanent class of seemingly wealthy elitists. And believe me, I'm very liberal, but you can see the damage that happens when you have people at the very top of the chain who are obscenely wealthy. I mean, it's crazy the amount of money these people have. A permanent underclass that is mired in opiates, uh, addiction, uh, bad nutrition, bad education. The education system is letting them down in a way that's so profound and impossible to pull them out of. And then you have this vast group of people in the middle who are trying really hard to lean into the future and want to understand, want to be part of it, but have not neither the skills nor the, again, the education system has let them down. To be pull, to to pull up this group beneath them and the group above them isn't pulling people up and so uh, it's a really this is a group of people who could really make profound change and they don't is really enormously disappointing to me to see to, to this to have this much um, power and money and influence and <coughs> use it for the most the stupidest of things right <laughs> like, you know I want them to work on like there's very few people working on climate change. Uh, you know, techno technological solutions. I think it's just Elon Musk and Bill Gates right now, like really, who are doing profound, or, or somewhat profound work on it. Um, and so, looking at those issues, I think that they, 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 the issues that are critically important going forward: climate change, education, healthcare. They tend to spend a lot of time on what I find ephemeral and silly things. I'm perfectly happy with Tinder, but come on, like you know what I mean? I want them to think bigger um, on, on bigger things. I'd like to pull a little bit of one um, thread of that, and I spent a lot of time thinking and talking about um, platform responsibility. Yeah. And I, I get why Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want Facebook to be called a publisher, I get why YouTube doesn't want yeah. to be called a broadcaster, uh, but fine, don't call that. But but why, why not? Why? But, what are, but what are they then, and what ethics? Why not? Why do we let them decide what they're called? Like, you know, well, do you that's a man, right dude. There, <laughs> he, wants call, he wants to call himself a giraffe. I'm not going to agree with him. Like, come on. Like, do you have Facebook as a publisher? Of course it is. Come on. And so it's not a publisher in the new, in the old sense. It's because you're mired in the past. It's a publisher. It publishes things. It just doesn't want the responsibility that comes with publishing. We had had companies that understood the responsibility and then were liable for what they put over their pipes or in their newspapers or whatever. I'm going to write about this next week, but there's a there's a thing called the Communications Decency Act that was passed. I wrote about it. Yeah, and I wrote about it. I got some law students in here and I tell you what it's all about. It's like a get out of jail free card for the whole internet. And it's, it's you know, I just interviewed Nancy Pelosi last week about tech stuff. Um, I was at the House Democratic Caucus. I gave a speech about some of the issues I think they need to focus on. That's a crazy group of people. I'm just telling you, that's a crazy wacky group of people. They're so different. It's like, you know, the Republicans are all in lockstep and they're all sitting in rows, you know, like, like some weird fascist organization. And they put the Republican Democrats are everywhere. And they're like poking at you. It's really funny. It's really interesting. Uh, my son was like, I brought both of my sons, and one of my, oh, my youngest son was like, Mom, this is like America, but in a ballroom. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, so uh, what was the time? Oh, section two thirty. Uh, so the, 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 it gives them broad immunity, and I wrote about it at the time. It was to, in order to allow these companies to grow, and they did. Now they're multi-billion-dollar or multi-zillion-trillion, right? Uh, organizations, and and they they still are protected in the way no other businesses are, including journalistic enterprises. If we do something wrong, we get sued. Right? And fairly, that's a fair thing. 
they do something wrong, we're not liable. Right, well, what do you think of the FTC uh, uh, today? Okay. Well, I'll we'll read it. Uh, I, let three, me, three to five billion? Yeah, I, it's really interesting. I just was, look, the FTC has been asleep at the wheel for a long time about a lot of this stuff. Let's be clear, they're not doing their jobs in any way. So I think I, the thing I wrote was, um, uh, how can I best describe the client of three to five billion dollar Facebook is likely to pay to the Federal Trade Commission? How about it's a parking ticket, not a speeding ticket, not a DUI, or a DI, DUIP, data under the influence of Putin. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a parking ticket. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous, I know, let me see, let me see what they also add to the thing. They may like restrict them. So by no means, this number already tells me that what they're gonna ask them to do it's not going to be stringent. There's no way because they, they already violated the decree. They violated yeah, yeah. the, the, the like, line is for violating what they already did. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, they this said this line says to them it's cost of doing business and it's a very minor cost of doing business. And it says, okay, don't do it again like you did the last time. You can do it again. And you should Charlie Wurzel also did a great piece of listing the things they've done just in this year. It's like really like and every time, you know, they, they don their hoodies and they go, oh, well, oh, well, so sorry. So sorry we got hacked. So sorry we violated this. So sorry we did that. Oh, the Russian bots? Oops. Like, you know, it's, it's literally like ongoing brain spears on you because I did it again. And so you just sort of like, and then today I was arguing with someone on Twitter. They're like, oh, you should, you know, they didn't mean to do it. They were naive. I'm like, the richest people in the world are naive. Are you kidding me? You know, I just, I just, it's, it's, it's insanity that we allow this to go on. Well, do you think the lack of diversity in tech leadership, you, you started this out saying, if you're a woman, be in charge. If there right. were more women in charge, do you think okay. that responsibility I, would be seen differently? Well, there are, you know, Cheryl's there, Cheryl Sandberg, who, they're all very nice people. That's the, you know what I mean? They're all, like, very reasonable people. And, you know, compared to, like, a banker or an oil executive, they're really pleasant. They're, like, that's the, that's the problem, is that, um, that they, they see themselves as good, and they are good people. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of a weird situation. And they're quite accessible, so you can talk to them. And they're very blabby. Mark has put out 90 op-eds and everything else, and he's available now. He's doing a podcast, which is fascinating. Um, and and so I don't know if they had more to, I, I do know that the numbers are really disturbing. When you have know, 90% of management to be white men, it's just it's just not a good thing for the company. It seems it's a good thing for the company, but it's not necessarily going to give you the broadest point of views, especially when your people who use your services are a broad swath of humanity. So you would love, you would imagine that a broader group would make for better decision making um, or some uh, some idea of what to do, especially around the products. And the, the thing I like to think about is. It's really hard, and I talked about this when I went and when they showed me FaceTime. I kept pointing out the problems over and over again. Don't what about murder? What about bullying? What about sexual harassment? And they don't. It's down at number fifty on their list, right? Or Twitter. Twitter's a really good example. What took so long to deal with bullying, and they still haven't, was because nobody in the top echelons of Twitter had been bullied. So why would they think about bullying? Like, what are you talking about? Like, really? There's, there's, people are calling you names on Twitter? That's too bad. Like, no, no, they're trying to dismember me. Like, they're, they're, you know what I mean? Like, it's a really interesting, if you don't feel unsafe a day in your life, you really are not gonna understand people who feel unsafe. And I, you can see it in your, your daily life. Like, I have two sons, they're both almost six feet tall now. Like, I think they are, they're real tall, I'm real short. So, um, they, it was, I was I used this example. I was walking down the street with one of my sons. We live in the Shaw. We have a house in that Shaw section of DC. I also live in San Francisco. And I it was night, and so I was doing what all women do, which is like this: like where's everyone? Where's everything? Like let me just figure out what the situation is. And he's like, "What are you looking at?" And I'm like, "People around the bushes." <laughs> like, I don't know, like the thing I'm always nervous about. And he's like, "Why?" And I was like, oh my God, you don't think, I just do, I don't know why I was so thick, but I was like, you don't feel it's, it's unsafe a day in your life. You do not worry about walking down the street when you ever do. You don't worry about the police, so you're not your white guy, you don't worry about that, you don't worry about this, you don't worry. It was really interesting, it was a really interesting observation. 
And he yeah, was sort of mystified why yeah, I was I think the Kavanaugh hearings brought out a lot of that. There was a real, I, I yeah. don't quite remember a gender divide like I recall from that time. Although it was very difficult for men in my life to believe that that happened as well. Parties. But women were like, I can point out the people to you. Right, exactly. So it was interesting. It, you know, but it's also basically, it's not just like, it was, I had a very interesting, it was, what's happened now, especially because it picks journalists, everyone's per, perspective is so skewed by partisanship now. It's really hard to get, I had someone, I was at the Media Lab this week at MIT, and Joey Ito, who's the director, I'm going to on the podcast soon, um, it said to me, he was trying to get to his staff that they really have to be thinking about what truth is, like how to deal with what truth is and what's not. And he said, when truth becomes political, you have to become political. Like you can't avoid it. And that's what's happened is truth has become political. Uh, and we've allowed it to happen. Uh, basic facts and things like that. And so it's very hard. You either raise a group of people, new readers or new whatever, who don't trust anything or you raise a very sophisticated group who understand what's going on and do pick and choose. Um, I do have hope though. I do, you know, my kids are pretty sophisticated in knowing what's happening, like in terms of things. They catch on really quickly um, to, to bullshit, which is really interesting. Um, they're also super attracted to new voices uh, uh, like uh, Alexander Cortez. They're very attracted to Pete. Uh, your Pete, they're very attracted to, it. it's interesting what's attracting them. Um, and so I do, I, at one hand, I'm like, this. we've been inundated with so much noise, it's really hard to be a good journalist, and things pass by like, like stories go back by like that. Like that tax story on Trump, which won the Pulitzer deservedly, was an astonishing display of journalism. What a great, in the old days, that would have been around for months. It went like, like, that's what happens to them. And so that's that's the one thing I'm worried about in stories. They just next. Next. Thank you. Well, before I turn over to audience questions, that's sort of signals to our fellows to get all mic'd up. Um, and when we do turn to questions, if you could please wait uh, for the microphone to get to you so that our friends on the live stream uh, can hear your excellent queries. Uh, what are some of the more difficult decisions you've had to make? Where, where have ethics really been a challenge in your own individual reporting? And the part two of that question is, I'm really into self-reflection, and, and uh, one of your tragedies is a lack of self-awareness. What's a decision you made that you'd like to have back? Oh, that's a good question. Um, hey, I'm <laughs> interviewing the interviewer. <laughs> I can't think of one, actually. I have to say, I think we spent a lot of time thinking hard about the decisions we make. Um, I think probably uh, <coughs> Easter, the first one was, what are some of the what are some of the tough I think you want to meet too. We were person. writing about this a little bit. We didn't do as much as other sites. We had written a lot about Ellen Powell, but a couple of different sites wrote about some others. Um, was uh, we had written the the CEO of Search Fix, Katarina, uh, yeah. Um, she was bothered by this one VC. She was one of the many people, and she was unidentified. And we spent a, I spent a lot of time. Uh, persuading her to talk. We were going to write about her anyway, because it was very, it was in the, we had the paperwork, we had everything else. But it was a really difficult ethical quandary. Um, she was this most prominent, one of the most prominent women CEOs. She had undergone this. And I, I wanted to put a face to what happened and get her to talk about it. And so we, we didn't force her into it. She did it, she wanted to do it, but I think it was really hard they, to ask someone who was just about to go public to talk about something that obviously would it would hinder her. It just does. Like when she, it just does. Um, and so it was a really big debate within our group of people about what to do about that. And she did it. She did talk about it and very, not a lot, but she did it and discussed it. And it, that was great. I think that was really great. So asking people to do things that might hurt them is really hard. That might hurt them. And we do have the reporting, it's hard to say we're not going to do it, but it's really, it's a very difficult thing when there are, there, there's a price to pay. Um, I myself had undergone, uh, when I was a young reporter, I, I've talked about this, like, I'm slight, but I did a thing. I worked for John McLaughlin, even though I'm super liberal, I mean, he, he's, he's well, now he's not considered conservative, whatever it is, conservative now, but um, he, he sexually harassed people in the office, and I testified against him. And so I do understand the that like the, I was 22 at the time or something like that. Now, given that I wasn't interested in being part of the conservative 
groups in Washington and, and or in the journalism circles of conservative journalism. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a price that I paid for this, and I think that uh, so I, it wasn't hard for me to drop a dime on him. Like it wasn't a difficult thing, um, but it was because I was 22 and I was young and things like that. And so I think having when people have to pay a price, that's really hard to, to ask them to do that. At the same time. That's how change happens, right? So that's that it's a real. That's I think a really uh, uh, difficult thing. I, mean, I think of something. Um, I think I regret not being more aggressive around a lot of stuff. Like not not coming. You no, know, I think I've been super aggressive. Um, at the time, years ago, someone I was going out with was like, "You need to be harder." on these people, because I knew them really well. I, I thought it was pretty hard. I did very tough beat journalism. But uh, they were like, you're too, you too, you're too forgiving of them, and you need to be harder. And it was just before Uber. And it had a, um, it had a, and I was like, no, no, I'm pretty hard. And, I was there, and, and, and she was like, you have more impact than you realize. Like, you can really change things, and you're being, you're pulling the punches a little bit. And I, I was completely right. It was a completely right thing to say. Since then, I've been, like gone crazy. Like I like, we went at Uber. We went at like I sort of had. I think I was not. I, I think since then, and that's years and years and years. I think I was sort of doing the typical beat thing. On one hand, on the other hand, the to be fair. There's an expression to be fair that I used to. Use, they used to. I didn't use it. The Wall Street Journal. Like you write, Webman is. Cratering. To be fair, some people think <laughs> let's not be fair. It was cratering. Like that was really like I had done the reporting and I could definitively say the company was going to be in trouble. And so the I was doing. It's good to be fair, but there's it's there's a point where it's not. Like if you do great reporting, you can definitively say something. And so I think that's what changed in me. Um, I I was very much on one hand, on the other hand. And if you do great reporting and you come to a conclusion, you can say. With, and, and not worry that people think you're being biased because you're not. You did reporting. You looked into it, either you did the data, you did whatever you did, whatever you did to prove your case. You don't or your piece. You should shouldn't shy away from that. And I think a lot of journalists do that. And since then, my instincts have been correct. Like now, everyone's like, "Oh yeah, Facebook's bad." I'm like, "Yeah," like you know what I mean. Like, but I should have told before. I should have said, "Here's a problem coming," and define it. Um, and that's. I mean, Okay, who has questions? Journalists. Right? Resistance among the employees. Yeah. Google, Amazon, whether or not it's against Project Maven, I know, the Pentagon Project, or internally some very recent uh, resistances uh, with the AI ethics board at, uh, at Google. Uh, and uh, of course, a walkout in Google. Is this real? Is it organized? Can you characterize it? Yeah. And can it continue and maybe spread throughout the high tech community? Thanks very much. No problem. I, have, I, I did a really great podcast with the Google walkout organizers, which you should listen to. It's a great podcast. Meredith Whitaker. It's great episode. There's seven of them, um, mostly women, one, one guy. Um, and it was really, it was great that they were doing this. They were publicly taking on the company. Here's, here's an issue, though. A lot of the protests have been about things about themselves, like to improve things for themselves. It's not been as much. There's been no one at Facebook that's gotten up as a group and saying, what are we doing abusing people's information? They're not, they're not pushing for they're pushing for themselves, a lot of them. That said, there's some groups that, like, I don't want to work on uh, Defense Department things. I don't want to work on this. Um, and I think a lot of the companies are hearing that um, and doing something about it. Now, whether they come out with the decisions that these employees like, like Mark Benioff had a debate internally about working for uh, Customs and Border, they were doing something else around resumes, but it linked up. It wasn't quite ICE, but these people didn't want to work. Anyway, it just, there's debate going on, which is really great. That's really great because employees in Silicon Valley have power. What I wonder about is if it will flame out like a lot of things. We'll give them more kombucha. We'll give them more free massages. We'll give them more free dry cleaning. And why don't we pick up this for you? Why don't we do that? If you go to these campuses, it's a ridiculous display of coddling. It's astonishing um, what they do. And so I and here's some more money 
And that's my worry, is that they won't continue it. And right now, there was a good story of the people that will walk out there claiming, Meredith Whitaker and others, uh, are claiming um, yeah, retaliation. You know, there's some retaliation that seems to be going on. And they, then they had agonized meetings saying, well, we're not the kind of people that retaliate. But you know, they really are the kind of people that retaliate. It's just a different style of retaliation. Um, so, so again, it goes to that lack of self-awareness that they don't like, I don't think they like outspoken people within the ranks as much as they talk about. They like controlled outspokenness, where they give them, uh, they let them have these Friday meetings where everyone yells about something. It's usually about lunch. Um, and and they, they, let, they let them have these outrage outlets, but then real change doesn't seem to happen unless you absolutely shame them into it. That's my call. I, that's my job. I like to do that. That's what I tend to try to do. Um, but you do get insight into how they think in, in, in the weirdest of ways. I mean, it, I urge you if you want to listen to something fascinating, this is my podcast with Mark Zuckerberg last year, um, in which uh, I, I think it was one of the best interviews I've done because you got some real insight into his thinking, uh, not on purpose, um, because of in this very idea of lack of self-awareness. Um, we had exchange around Holocaust deniers that is just astonishing if you listen to it, around China, around what he, what the, 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 his feelings about things he invented causing deaths across the globe and his lack of ability to talk about it in any casual way. Um, I think you'll learn a lot. And so one of the things that they tend to get into, unfortunately, is, is a crouch. These people get into crouches. And they don't, uh, once you start attacking them, and it's not even attacking them, pointing out important critical feedback, they tend to uh, feel victimized. And I, I can't tell you how many people are like, you're real mean to me, Kara. I'm like, are you? Fucking kidding me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're you're mean. I'm like, no. I said you shouldn't be wrecking democracy. I think, it's really funny. It's funny. There's a very big to me thing going on right now. Like it's it's riveting. To whatever. Yeah. Other question? Room full of journalists. Come on, turn it up. I have I have another. Oh. Hi, so my name is Logan Root. I'm a senior here in the J School. Um, earlier you mentioned that you realized pretty early on in your career that the internet was going to be this big change for how media was um, consumed. And so I'm curious, do you see a gap in between younger journalists who grew up using the internet and journalists who would sort of uh, were exposed to it as this turning point in their careers? And if so, how do you sort of bridge that connection? Well, I think everyone's gotten a message about I mean, even the people who didn't start with this has gotten a message that you have to use it, use the internet, and understand these, these tools. So I don't think the, the I think the media is, when I, when I was pushing this on to the people at the Washington Post or elsewhere, like, you got to get online, you got to get um, uh, get going on this, it, it, was, it was resistant. They were resistant and really did. did there, I, I always tell this famous story that there was a, there are all these focus groups in the Wall Street Journal about this. They had a Saturday journal, right? They were going through a Saturday journal, paper journal. And uh, they, had, they had focus groups, like with young people. And the whole premise was how do we get young people to read the newspaper? You know, that thing, that meeting, which is the worst. And I, 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 they meant reading the physical newspaper. That's what they meant. And I was like, young people like news. They just don't like it in the newspaper. Like, it's just okay that it's a different medium. Like, and I kept arguing. I'm like, if you want it on salami, print it on salami and let them eat it. I don't care. Like, it's just like, don't stop being sucked up into the media, the media itself. And I was in a meeting. They don't invite me to a lot of meetings. So they never, people never invite me to a lot of meetings. Um, and it was the thing about the focus groups, and they're like. Let's have some ideas about how we can get young people to read the news. I just, I just literally was sitting there, and I'm sitting in the back, and I put up my hand, and I'm like, oh, Kara, what, you, what is your suggestion? I said, why don't you tape a joint between every page, perhaps? <laughs> and they're like, that's not helpful. I said, that's really helpful. I think it's a really good idea. It's, you know, this is going to be legal someday, and blah, blah, blah. It, just, it was just exhausting. And, but now that's not the case. Everyone gets it. Um, what I do think is they've gotten too pulled into Twitter, like the, there's, there's Twitter journalism and 
journalism, right? So they've gotten too pulled into that um, waste of time stuff um, versus what, what they're doing. But I do think there's some amazing data. I just did a podcast, I think it's going up today, with Julie Angwin from The Markup. That was going to ask you what yeah. you thought about that yeah. last week. Well, it's she was in charge. She and was then, in charge. Yeah, well, she has, she has her say, and then we actually talked to her other founders who disagree with her. They'll all be up today talking about it. Um, I haven't talked to the founders, one of my reporters did, so I don't know closely what she's, she has a case. Having started a startup, I think my determination is their, their fault for firing her. Um, she's a great journalist, she's a great data journalist, like amazing data. She just relies on data, like that's it, like, and she's great at that. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of people who do get it and do understand. I think the question would be when it moves to VR, AR, and other things, where is how do you how do you give get those skills? And if I was a young studying, I'd really go on my AR and VR skills. I think that's a really interesting area. I probably won't do that much of it because I'm exhausted. So you know, I've done enough. Um, but I think that's kind of interesting. I think story tell stories in you know, in different ways is interesting. Um, and how you um, but I do think most. Mostly everyone's moved over to getting it. It's coming over mobile. It's going to be at any time. It's in pieces. The idea of a singular offering is over, just the way the network should or, or any pretty shit networks. Yeah, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Lee Jackson from the University of Wisconsin. Still this morning. Uh, I'm just questioning, uh, when you really got into journalism, uh, as a young student into journalism, uh, what were the obstacles that you went through? I mean, you talk about knowing yourself, knowing your niche, um, with writing and everything like that, because uh, if you can't really interact or know other people's lifestyles, right. how are you going to be able to write about it? So, uh, what are some of the obstacles that you've gone through as a journalist, uh, whether it be for the Post or um, you know, writing in general, like, uh, how did you get through it, and what is the best suggestions for a, a young journalist right here? I think, I, it's interesting, I always think about what, how can you do all, I think the ability to tell good stories and listen to people and hear their stories is at the heart of it still, even despite all these bells and whistles, the ability for narrative storytelling, the narrative is critically important, I think identifying a narrative is so important to figuring out how you write about anything. And you can get caught up in small incremental stories over and over again and not make sense of them and just write them, write them, write them, write them. That's over. That's that's completely over. The idea of um, of just this is what happened at the state house yesterday. This is what happened. Everybody knows like that's that's commodity journalism now, really. Um, so I think you've got to find a way to tell stories to readers or listeners or whatever in a way that's a compelling narrative about people's lives. And I still think that just is at the heart of everything. From an obstacle point of view, um, you know, there's the no. Like, no, you can't do this. I had so many no's. I just don't hear no at all. I didn't think I don't know how else to put it. I just really don't. Oh, I don't agree with you. I, I, I'm fundamentally obnoxious, so I think that really has helped me a lot. And I'm fundamentally, I can't not say especially the people in power. Like, I just have this thing where I have to nag them. I just don't understand it, but it's been since the beginning of time. And, you know, there's a well-known story about how I first got my job uh, at the Washington Post. I was writing for the book of the student newspaper, La Jolla, and uh, they had sent a reporter to cover a speech, and they had done a bad job, there were misspellings, and I loved the Washington Post, and I was mad. You know, so I call, I got on the phone, and I'm what the hell did you do? And of course, they never occurred to me. They sent their literally their worst reporter to the shitty assignment at Georgetown. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's not where you send the star reporters, which they should in a weird way. Um, so, uh, so I was mad, and they were like, "Come down there and tell us to our face." I'm like, "All oh, right, I will." <laughs> and so I literally got on a bus, the G two, and G two, and went down to the post newsroom. And the person I got on the phone was the Metro editor, this guy's name Larry Kramer. And uh, luckily, I got the right person on the phone. And I was complaining. I was like, "How dare you do a bad job? Like even on a small story, like this is a, this is not nice to readers. It's not nice to yourselves. How dare you? It's disrespectful to journalism." I was like, very like, ang I'm still angry when that happens. Um, 
And so I, they gave me, he was like, do you think you could do it better? And I'm like, yeah, I could, absolutely. Like, you asshole. And so and, and he hired me, like, to be a slipper. So I, I think just not, I think a lot of people, especially journalists, for some reason, go along a lot of the time to decisions in the newsroom. And I get the political aspects of it. I get, like, you can't speak up, you can't say anything, you can't be a loud voice. Um, I think especially women and marginalized people of color, they, you can't say things, right? Just say them. Because you're not going to get it. They're not going to let you in anyway. So you might as well just not have stress. Like, you might as well. And so I think that's a really important thing. Was I just, even today, I'm like, I just can't help it. I just can't help myself. It's weird. Like, the, the Facebook people are calling me this morning about this story I wrote. And I literally, they're like, we need to talk about it. I'm like, no. no. Well, you have to talk to us. I'm like, do I? Do I have to talk to you? No, I don't. I have an opinion about your stupid fine. It's a parking ticket. Sorry. Like, get someone else to write that it's not. Um, but I think it's just a, it's a quality you have to have as a journalist to be disputatious, but polite, I guess. But, you know, like, don't be, don't, you have to know your stuff. That, that's all. But I think it's really hard for young people to do that because you think there's cost, right? You do think, but there isn't a cost. There isn't actually a cost. The cost is not saying things. The cost is going along. The cost is waiting till later. And I think a lot of young people, I, I do this with my sons, um, you get on this achievement wheel, right? And so if you behave, you get to the next one. But really you don't. Like, it's just, it's a lie. It's, it's kind of a weird lie. And so sometimes when, I'm a terrible parent at my school, teachers hate me because, you know, they give too much homework. If you're a parent, you know about this, the ridiculous, pointless homework that kids have to do instead of thinking and understanding teamwork and things like that. And so when they come home with homework, I'm like, don't do it. it doesn't <laughs> um, so the teacher's like, will you stop telling your children it doesn't matter? I'm saying, oh, it doesn't. I'm going to tell you, I employ a lot of people. I'm not going to fuck because I can write a stupid essay on this Gerald. I just don't. Like, they, I'm glad they can write. I want them to be able to write, but the way they assign it is so mind blowing numb. Um, and so I do that all the time in school. I'm like, don't do that. And this is the point where I really hope Ellie Pelver is not watching the live stream. Like, right? It's true, right? Come on. Okay, so I was What a story that was. Oh, my goodness. What the hell? This is crazy. It's a great story. Okay, we've got time for one more up here. Two. Oh, we have two. Let's let's go back there and then come up here. Thank you. I'm sure there's something you said about sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, I think a lot of people would agree that it's not necessarily about you know, whether or not you're welcoming it or about power. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about a time in which you had to be directly with your own practices and holding others accountable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that. Um, I, I think a lot about the code, I'll talk about the code conference. We spent a lot of time with like the big honking, swinging ones of the internet, right? They happen to be all white men. And so we spent a lot of time, and I think I fail a lot, um, getting enough, this year, no, I've got like half and half. Like I spent a lot of time making sure the stages of code, because I know how influential they are, are as, as diverse as possible. And I'm not just doing it just for diversity. And, I'm doing it because I think it's right, it makes a more interesting conference, but I definitely s struggle because I do have a hard harder time getting women to appear. I have a harder time getting people color to appear. And I don't know it's because I don't have enough of them or they get asked too much or that, you know, I, it's, I struggle with that and I am embarrassed by myself almost continually, even though I try really hard. And I, I also don't want to be one of those people that goes, well, I tried really hard. Like, you know, please forgive me that I ended up. Yes, I find yourself women, but I, I do, but it, I don't succeed. And I, I sit around a lot, and I've done it for 16 years. And so I find it incredibly frustrating. I still haven't cracked the ability to create, you know, it is the big names conference, but at the same time, should I change that? Should I, but that's what people are buying. So it's a really, I think I, I, I don't think I, as much time as I spend on it, I need to spend more time on it. I think I really do, because I think it does as an indicator to the industry what's important, because it happens to be the conference. The other thing is I don't think, in the, relatedly, I don't think I think enough on, in our coverage if we're quoting the right people, if we're stuff like that, I don't. I, it just goes by you because you're sort of in the rush of covering things. 
how you then just naturally go to the people you go to. Um, and so thinking outside of, right now we're doing this thing where I do a podcast all day, and I'm thinking really hard about making it different. Um, so people, because I think it's great for everyone to experience differences, including myself. And so I think I fail a lot on that. I do, I think I do. I haven't thought, I think you swim in that ocean and then you behave like that. Like I think that's, and I have to constantly be checking myself and I don't think I check myself enough. And also the same thing around wealth, around privilege. And you know, I live right now, honestly, this is like crazy, but I have a house in the cat. I, 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 I have a house in San Francisco I bought a long time ago, which means it's worth a lot of money, but I didn't buy it for that much money. Um, I have a house in San Francisco with Castro. I have a house in Shaw in DC, because I kid, we, I'm divorced and we have kids. And I'm also going to be I, going out with someone who lives in Park Slope, and I'm like, literally, I'm living in the most elite peak places, ridiculous places in the world. Like, I almost should just call him, like, I am your enemy. Like, you know, Donald Trump. Like, I live in Park Slope, Castro, Shaw. Like, wow! Like, you really have to hate me. I'm a coastal elite, like, you can't believe. And so it's, I think about that. Like, I think about what, I think about that. And then in parenting, I think, I, I think I've actually done a good job in that. But I think about it all the time of what, um, of being a better parent in that regard, trying to make them aware of those things at the same time, um, be, let them think for themselves. I'm wondering what advice you'd have for uh, younger journalists and female journalists about expectations of likability, right? Where um, whether or not you, you want to acknowledge it, often I feel there are, uh, women are expected to be yeah. like, or expected to do that extra emotional labor either you know, in their newsroom, in their, you know, in their employee, in their interview situations. Um, what, what advice to, do you have for people to deal with that? Particularly if they don't have the, if they're not in charge, they don't have the power and the budget, right. the influence. So it, it, obviously, I didn't get that memo. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, I, it's interesting. I do think about that a lot, like, like, like because I'm, I think I'm funny. I think that helps. Like, I think it helps that sometimes I, I think, I hate, I hate to say this, but being a lesbian helps because, like, everyone likes a sassy lesbian. Like, they're okay with that. Like, she's allowed to say those things. So, wacky Kara, she's doing it again. Um, you know, you're sort of, you sort of have that scale. And so, I, it sounds crazy, but I do think you get a more permission. I think, I think that's one of the reasons I don't care about likability because I always knew that they didn't like this one thing, so what the hell? Like, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. Now it's changed drastically, but when I, I'm an older person, so I understand it was harder then. And so I think I didn't think about likability as much. It didn't matter because they didn't like me anyway for stupid reasons. And so ah, I'll just give it up. And it's turned out to be incredibly freeing. Um, doesn't mean you want to be a jerk, but you, when you don't have to be the good girl or you don't have to be the, it's it's freeing. And I'll tell you this one story and we'll finish. Is I had an executive, pretty high ranking executive. Internet um, left a job, high, like about near the top, but not the top, um, and came to me and said, "What? A lot of people do that. Like, what do you think I should do? Like, once after we are done with the war, they come and ask for advice." And um, and I said, "Well, what do you want to do?" And she was like, "Well, I've been offered this, 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 and this, right?" And I said, "Yeah, but what do you want to do?" And she's like, "Well, this is interesting." And I said, "No, no, no. I'm not asking you what you were offered." I'm asking what you want to do. And I think a lot of people, but especially women, like tend to go from thing to thing to thing, whether it's a really, who's asking you the prom, who's asking you to get married, who's that? Like it's a rolling kind of choice thing. And I said, the way I try to look at it is, you know, you're at a restaurant and there's chicken, beef, and pork. Well, I want duck. I want the duck. Well, it's not on the menu, but I want the duck. Get me the duck. And so I spent a lot of time saying I want the duck. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, it just you have to really be aware of the things you want in life and be super, have to do that because, and, and be honest with yourself. And it's really hard. And I think likability goes away when you do that. Like, if you, can, if you can tend to do this. And one of the greatest reasons I think I'm successful is because I really do know myself very well. You know, no, no say, test, whatever that expression is. I'm a terrible employee. Terrible. 
terrible employee, I decided not to work for anyone anymore. That was a really good choice, and I decided to be an entrepreneur, because I knew that I'm a terrible employee. <coughs> Recently, I'm like, I don't want to manage anybody else, so I'm going to staff zero. I'm trying to go to staff zero. Like, I don't want to, man I, I'm a good manager, actually, turns out, but I don't like it. Like, I, I, I constantly am doing that, constant reassessment. And you should do that as a reporter, constantly reassess everything that you're doing. And I think likability is nice to be nice to the people you love, but it's not a necessary thing for success. It doesn't mean to be an asshole, but it's certainly, the more you're doing that, the less you're doing for yourself, unless you're doing for yourself, it's the less success that you can help other people. So, Podcast, but a podcast episode that you did recently with Poppy Harlow from CNN really dug into that question. Poppy is good. What is it? <laughs> Crazy name. <laughs> uh, but what's the difference between being liked and being respected? And uh, I think it's, it's well worth it. Yeah. Well worth the listen. I mean, you didn't go into journalism to be liked, right? Because yes. if you did, you have a problem. <laughs> Correct? But it doesn't matter what you think, it's how people treat you and how you deal with the fact that they still have an expectation of whether you like or not. I find if you're the person you are, you tend to do a lot better. It's just a lot easier. It's just a lot easier. And if people don't like you, mm -hmm. well, all right. Uh, I'm going to pick up on one thing you said toward the end there is that it's important for us to constantly reassess, to always be reflecting, thinking, and moving on. And that is what we are going to do with the rest of our day. Our first panel is going to begin looking at representations um, when it comes to gender and journalism across the board. Then we're going to move on and uh, talk about relationships within journalism, the roles we play, and what that means. And then we're going to close out the day with the problem and solutions piece. So do not let this, do not let this play. Where do we go from here? And, and we're hoping that the day is going to be interactive. We're hoping uh, that it's going to be challenging. And I think we started out one, one more things. observation. I just did a podcast with the We Croak people. It's an app that, that sends you five quotes about death every day. Oh, yeah. I, it's wonderful. Listen to it. It's an amazing app. Let me just say something. Every time you have a decision, look in the mirror and say, I'm going to be dead in 50 years or whatever age you are. It will change everything. Let me just tell you, you're going to be dead. By the way, everyone here, you're dying. Just so you know, don't worry about it. I need to be rude, but you know what I mean? Listen to that podcast. You'll, you'll learn a lot. It's a great app, too. It's a fantastic app. You'll be much happier. And read Kara's New York Times piece on uh, the stroke that she had and, yes. and uh, the clarifying uh, nature of those kinds of questions. Yeah, the all of you. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Ray. Well, I'll be the glasses half full girl. I'm totally going to die. I'm totally going to die. I asked the question, but not today. Not today. Thank you so much for listening.